Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Merry Christmas. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. During this holy season, I am so honored to offer you my testimony of God's power in our lives this year. I would like to begin, though, by also um, offering my profound gratitude for this congregation's support for me and my family. I think that many of you know what happened to me, um, but I'm going to start by telling the story and, and talk a little bit about how faith and family and friends played such a role in my recovery. I'd also like to share a bit about the issues that I've struggled with. I spent a lot of time these past several months thinking about the concepts of gratitude, grief, a little bit of guilt, and finally, grace. We all have struggles, and I know many have faced tragedy and sometimes real pain. So I'm honored to share my efforts to make sense of it all. It, it seems unfair to me <laughs> somehow that I don't remember the moment in the accident. I hate not knowing what happened to me. People say, oh, well, it's probably better that way, but I'm really not so sure. Um, but one thing I am sure about is the truth of the saying, that life can change in an instant. A perfectly ordinary instant. One moment I was standing on a train after a long, normal day, texting my husband that we just left Philadelphia and I'd be home soon. And the next thing I know, it was three days and about five surgeries later. It, it was sort of like a long series of unrelated dreams. <clears throat> Not unpleasant, but, but unusual. And, and one of them was, was a hospital dream, and there was a lot of activity and, and people looking down on me. But a lot of other dreams, equally vivid, that I don't remember now. But the odd thing was that the hospital dream kept coming back. And gradually, the dream and reality merged, the faces and the dream started to take on real features and spoke to me. I considered trying to speak back, but I was too tired. It had been a long day. The day of the accident, I'd left New Jersey early, taken the train to Washington, had a board meeting there, and then gone back to Philly to give a talk to a group that evening. I was sort of lost in thought at the train station. I left my iPad that I wanted to read up in my uh, luggage that I put above my seat. And I stood up to get it and, and held the rail above my head. And I remember thinking, we were going awfully fast. And I knew this route very well. I'd done it probably a hundred times. And it was always really annoying how slowly we went out of Philadelphia. <laughs> Um, I held on tighter and started to lose my balance, and that's the last thing I remember. Um, we know now that the train was going 106 miles an hour on a curve designed for a maximum speed of 50. They say that I was brought into the hospital dirty, just dirty, just, just covered in gray track dust <laughs> from head to toe. And one young doctor came up to my parents about a week after I'd been in the hospital. And apparently his job during the surgery, one of the first surgeries, was to, to uh, irrigate and get all the pebbles and, and dirt out of my eyes. And he asked my parents if I could see. And they said yes. And, and he was delighted to know that I hadn't been blinded, and we were shocked to learn that that had ever been a possibility. That was one of the things we hadn't worried about. Um, and 
as I lay there unconscious those first few days, I understand that, that, that my mom and my sister um, just sat by my bedside and, and tried to clean the grit out of my ears and, and, and my neck and off my hands. We believe I was found uh, relatively quickly, not too long after the derailment. The first car of the train where I was sitting was completely ripped open. Um, and we believe I was thrown out of the train, but we don't know for sure. Someone found me unconscious, no ID, and very seriously injured. They brought me to the local hospital where they stabilized me, performed some surgery, and then life flighted me to Penn Presbyterian for more surgery. But meanwhile, my husband Jonathan had gotten my text and was relaxing at home with our three boys. And a few minutes later, as he was just reading the newspaper on his cell phone, he saw an alert, Amtrak train 188 derailed outside Philadelphia. He tried and couldn't reach me. Our nanny rushed over and held the boys and prayed all night long. Jonathan went to a neighbor who kindly insisted on driving and they headed to Philadelphia to find me. And all night long, for hours and hours and hours, they went from hospital to hospital to hospital, <laughs> trying to, to, to find an injured woman that fit my description. And on a humorous note, our neighbor got four traffic tickets that one night. <laughs> it's probably some sort of record, but after more than, than, than five hours of searching, with no word from me, Jonathan actually began praying that I was seriously injured because the alternative was too awful to contemplate. And finally, as morning broke, John found one more place where they said they had an unidentified woman from the train. He went, ultimately identified me, alerted my boys, and then called my parents and my sibling and told them what had happened. I don't want to be too graphic, but I was really messed up. <laughs> I, uh, all of my internal organs in the lower half of my abdomen were up in my chest. Um, one x-ray we have, just as an example, showed my bladder um, up above my heart. All sorts of perforated organs. My spleen was a mess. My lungs were collapsed. I was in bad shape. But the doctors repaired it. They put things and back in the right place, and then turn their attention to the broken bones. My orthopedic surgeon is, is kind of a down-to-earth guy, and he's really not given to a lot of exaggeration. But he told me later, your survival is a miracle. I had what they call it an open pelvic ring fracture and a flailed chest. In layman's terms, that means that my pelvis was completely broken into two disconnected halves and, and crushed on one side and, and disconnected from my spine. And as for my rib cage, <laughs> the surgeon just described it to me later as simply having been annihilated in his words. He also told me later that each of those two injuries, the dirty open wound, my pelvis, the broken pelvis, and the flail chest separately and apart from all the other trauma have a 50% rate of death. So the odds were not with me. My days in the hospital were characterized by a succession of visits from, like every service imaginable, orthopedics, pulmonary, urology, trauma, vascular, neurology, gastro, psychiatry, pain management, I mean, <laughs> they were all there. I was intubated and couldn't speak. Um, I had chest tubes, wound drains, stitches everywhere. 
I couldn't talk, I couldn't move, really anything except my arms. It was overwhelming, and there was so much pain. At times, it seemed impossible to bear. But I was surrounded from even before I regained consciousness. Every single day, all day long, by my family, my parents, my husband, my kids, my brothers and sister, and their spouses. I actually remember a lot of funny things that, that happened in the ICU and then in rehab. We were a big, funny group. <laughs> and, and we found something to laugh about almost every day. Um, but the main feelings I remember from those first awful weeks were not sadness, but gratitude and an intense need for the comfort of the Lord and my family by my side. I knew then I couldn't have made it without them. So my message today revolves kind of around three words that were really core to my experience over the past about seven months. Gratitude, grief, and grace. I wasn't trying to be alliterative or gimmicky here, but they all happened to start with G. Um, and and the, the words just capture perfectly my journey and the journey of my family over the past several months. So I'd like to discuss gratitude first. I, I really remember, it was, it was almost crazy positive those first few days, the feeling of gratitude that I was alive. But I didn't have a major head injury. I was a mess from shoulders to, to waist, but I didn't have a head injury and I wasn't paralyzed or blind. To be honest, I didn't really realize early on how seriously hurt I was. But I knew it could have been much worse. And I was grateful. Eight people died in the crash. And one of them I really identify with like me, she was a wife and mother in her mid-40s, a businesswoman going home from Philadelphia that day. Her name was Rachel Jacobs, and her family was looking for her that night, and there was media out about her. And as my husband went into that last hospital room to try to identify me, he actually overheard some staff talking in the corner, and he overheard them say, they think that we think it's Rachel Jacobs. And his heart sank. It wasn't. It was me. And her family, and the family of the seven other victims, grieved that day. Every time I think of that day, of my husband just frantically driving around Philly from hospital to hospital, my three sons at home, praying, crying, I mean, Googling the hospitals, and they were calling and trying to find me. I'm almost overcome the sadness at what might have been, and gratitude for what was. Gratitude that my boys won't grow up without their mom. And gratitude that my husband and I will have many more years to look forward to together. And an intense gratitude that my parents will never suffer the heartbreak of bearing a child. When I got home from the hospital, one of my sons asked me, are you sure you were in that first car? And I said, yes. And he said, are you really sure? And I said, yes. And, and I asked why he was so concerned. And he said, have you seen the pictures? And I said, well, I hadn't really wanted to focus on them. And, and <laughs> I just kind of seen them in passing. And uh, if I can have the slide, he, 
pulled it up on his iPad and blew it up and he put it in front of me and he said, how did you survive? He wanted to understand. And when you look at the sort of twisted hulk of, of metal there, it does seem impossible. I don't have a scientific answer, but what I said to him was, that is how great God is. And in the words of, of Luke, for with God, nothing will be impossible. In the hospital, the pain was worse, worse at night. Um, they would come in to clean my wounds and roll me over from one side to the other. And it was almost unbearable. I remember being cold, naked, vaguely embarrassed as, as two male nurses were, were you know, waving me and hurting so bad. And I remember thinking at the time, you really don't get much more vulnerable than this. <laughs> Laying there, unable to speak like that. And I remember thinking, this is when you give it to God. Um, literally, all I could do was pray. And also, God spoke to me in that moment through music. And music touches us in so many ways. I listened over and over every night as we went through this, you know, nighttime routine to a contemporary Christian song by Matt Mayer. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, your righteousness. My God, how I need you. And I would listen to that over and over. And it brought me through. I know now how worried they were about infection in that time. I know the odds were against me, but I know that God is great and God was with me. He helped me survive and get through the pain, so I am grateful for my faith. I'm also grateful for my family, for my husband who found me and has been my caregiver the past several months, for my boys who have been brave and steadfast and loving. For my parents, who came immediately and never left my side. They also made sure I never had to eat hospital food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also grateful for my siblings. They're all physicians. The three of them flew in from all different parts of the country. And along with their spouses, they've been there with me for every stage in my recovery. <clears throat> Besides being grateful for faith and for family, I'm also incredibly grateful for the larger community of people with whom I connected. Close friends, but also those I didn't know so well, or people I drifted away from, have been just incredible and reaching out to me. I remember when I first got out of the ICU, my assistant from the office brought in this bag of cards <laughs> and gifts that had been sent to me just in the past couple weeks. It was overwhelming. I mean, we're talking way over 100. It was so many people from different parts of my life, an extended family, many members of this congregation, and the support didn't fade. You know, as, as I began the hard work of recovery, and we tried to regain some normalcy at home, our family had so much support. I mean, just innumerable kindnesses that I couldn't even begin to list. 
And this is the first time I really remember when something felt too big to handle alone. Too big to handle even with family support. A year ago, I would have told you I was all about my family and my job. But never again will I underestimate the importance of these broader connections between us in the community. I truly felt embraced, lifted up, and protected. And I thank you. And boy, has it helped. <laughs> Today, I, you know what, since I left the hospital, I, I left the wheelchair behind. We threw away the walker, and I hate it. <laughs> and today I can walk several miles, although maybe not in Summit County. But <laughs> I hope I can do it. <laughs> um, I am not fully recovered, but I am stronger. And I hope that I can be the light that so many people have shared with me. From this experience, I, I hope you can understand. We can have the next slide. I was preparing for today and I actually got chills as I read Psalm 40, verses one through three. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He's given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. But as powerful and genuine as my feelings of gratitude the story really doesn't stop there. Sometime around July or August, I'd been home for a month or so, and I was really tired and hurt. And tired of the endless cycle of physical therapy and doctor's visits and medications. I was tired of not being able to drive myself, worrying about my position at work, Tired of trying to be strong. I'm tired of being tired. Um, I tell you, I, I wasn't feeling so grateful anymore. To God, to my husband, to anyone. I was gradually facing the reality that the accident wasn't just a little blip and recovery was going to be a much longer road. But I knew I was getting better. I was recovering in a beautiful house with a loving family, lots of support. What right did I have to feel sad or sorry for myself? I mean, certainly the families of the eight people that died had a lot more reason to grieve than I did. Why did they die? And why did I feel so sad? We can't know the answer to the first question. Ecclesiastes tells us that none of us has power over our fate. God has a plan, but God's ways are inscrutable to us. And I know now that I needed to feel sad and to feel okay about grieving what I'd lost. To paraphrase another well-known verse from Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season, a time to die, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh. And I have needed the time to grieve for those who were lost and their families, and also to grieve for my pain and that of my family. We can have the next slide. God also tells us, though, that he will help us through the grief. 
And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. So the two defining emotions um, of this journey have been gratitude and grief. They brought me to a place where I think I have a deeper appreciation of God's grace. And this is a concept I don't think I ever really understood before. But grace is the unearned or unmerited favor of God to man. In Ephesians, if you could have the next slide, chapter 2, it is written, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works, so no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The concept has helped me make sense of the accident and to start to move on. I can feel gratitude toward God without believing that somehow I deserve to live and those other people deserve to die. But also on the other hand, without thinking that it was just dumb cosmic luck. <laughs> but there is a plan. Grace is a gift and God has a plan. So I thank God for the undeserved gift of new life in Christ. I thank my family for making his love and his gifts very real in my own. I've received other gifts these past seven months. There really is a, a silver lining in almost everything. I've been forced to slow down. I spend more time with my husband. I'm home every day when my kids get home from school. And I know in our house, we hold each other a little tighter. And we say, I love you a little more. And that we are able to do so is a gift that we receive by the grace of God. The next slide. Our family about a couple months ago. So in this season of giving, I appreciate God's grace, his gifts, my family, friends, and community including from my heart. I appreciate so much the support from the members of this congregation. I pray that I live in accordance with God's grace, accepting what happened without bitterness and forgiving the people responsible for the accident. I pray that I appreciate the love around me and that I can be an example of that love walking in the way of the Lord. So it's Christmas, <laughs> the season of miracles, a season of light, a season of giving, gifts, of new beginnings, and life. We celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and are in awe of his power. Christmas is alive in all of us.